the battlefields of Bannerlord are going to be no place for the untrained peasant. If you want to have any hope of ruling Calradia, you're going to need to learn how the hell to fight. This begins with none other than good old fashioned knowledge of yourself, of your weapon, of your enemy, and of how combat works. And that is the aim of this guide, to ready you for the journey you'll embark on in a couple of months. So, whether you're a Mountain Blade veteran or a new arrival to the land, there will be something for you to learn here. And while the combat system is similar to Warband, so it'll feel familiar to all you veterans, there are some changes that are definitely useful to know if you want to be the most effective soldier you can be. Remember though, this is all pre-release, so some things are subject to change before final release. And just a quick thanks to Tailworld for getting in touch with me and providing some of the finer details of combat. Anyway, let's get on with it. We're going to begin with the basics. So Bannerlord combat works on a system that seems very simple on the face of it, but underneath there is actually a lot more going on than you might think. It's a fairly easy system to pick up, but it can be difficult to master. So let's start from the very beginning. You are a man, a simple man with nothing. It's your weapon and your armor that will determine your role on the battlefield. So your first decision is how you equip yourself. Do you want to be a balanced soldier with a one-handed weapon and shield? Do you want to be more aggressive with a two-handed weapon, which gives you a lot more damage at the expense of defense? Maybe you want to be able to deal with cavalry, so you'll bring long thrusting weapons like spears. Perhaps you prefer to stay at range out of the way of combat with bows, crossbows, or even thrown weapons like javelins. Or perhaps you prefer a mount with your blade and you can use any of that atop horseback. So a bunch of different ways to play, which are entirely up to you. Whatever kind of weapons you choose though, they will come with stats affecting their performance. You've got speed and damage stats of different types of attacks, which are fairly self-explanatory. Length, which is how long the weapon is and its reach. And then we have handling, which is a little more complicated. The handling stat is determined by the center of mass of the weapon, i.e. is it heavier at the hilt, is it heavier at the end like an axe, is it fairly balanced. It's also going to depend on the weapon type and how it's wielded, as in one or two hands, and overall affecting its inertia. Now, every single attack animation in the game actually has two animations going on at the same time. Take this right side axe swing for example. There is both a balanced and unbalanced version of the animation playing at the same time. They're just blended together. I like to think of the animations as the balanced attack being a master swordsman performing the attack, a samurai let's say. He'll use his katana with perfect technique and do a ton of damage. That's your balanced animation, a well-trained swordsman. Now hand that same sword to a peasant farmer and have him do the attack. It'll be an unbalanced, untrained mess which doesn't do a great deal of damage. So every single attack animation is a combination of a balanced and unbalanced attack which gives you your attack animation. And this is what your weapon handling affects. The better the handling of the weapon, the more of the balanced animation you'll get rather than unbalanced because the weapon is well made. If you have a shoddy weapon made by an amateur blacksmith, then it may have lower handling and thus more of the unbalanced animation and the lower potential for damage. So that weapon handling stat overall affects the attack animation. And the better that animation is, the more damage you'll potentially do. You may have 80% balanced and 20% unbalanced, meaning you've got a damn good animation that will give you a higher potential for good damage. Or if it's a crappy weapon, it may be the other way around with only 20% balanced and 80% unbalanced. It's all determined by your weapon handling stat. So hopefully that makes some sense. But alas, that's only the first part of it. What that balanced and unbalanced version of the attack actually affects is your damage zone. Well, what the hell is a damage zone, man? Allow me. So that blended animation will determine your damage zone. This white line represents the path my axe will follow and the animation of the right swing. Now, depending on when in this animation I hit my enemy will determine what kind of damage I do. It could look something like this. And if I hit my enemy here in the attack animation, which is very early, I'll do little to no damage because I've had no time to generate any power into the swing. So it'll be a very low damage hit. If we manage to make contact with our enemy in the yellow zone, it'll be much better and we'll manage to do a good bit more damage, but still not great. Where we really want to land our attack, of course, is in the green zone. Landing an attack in this part of the animation will do the most damage with this weapon, potentially. 
There are of course a bunch of other factors that go into determining damage, which you can see in my How Damage Works video, linked in the description and at the end of this video. So that's what a damage zone might look like. And what that means for the whole balanced, unbalanced animation thing is that the more of a balanced animation you have, the higher chance you have of landing powerful strikes because your green zone is going to be so much bigger. And as you might expect, on the contrary, if you have a really unbalanced animation, you might have a really low chance of landing those powerful strikes because you're just not proficient with that weapon or it's badly made. Now these are just my examples of how a damage zone might look, they're not official or anything. I'm just trying to illustrate how it works so hopefully you get the idea. I know this was a lot to take in, but all you really need to take away from all of this stuff I've just told you is that it's just very important on when you land your attack in the animation. You can get really proficient with your weapon if you can 9 times out of 10 land your strike in the green zone. You'll be doing a lot more damage than if you only ever land in the yellow zone. So it's going to take some skill and practice to get to know your weapons and how to properly use them. That whole job will be a lot easier though if you have a lot of stat points in that weapon skill and a decent well-made weapon. Now our attacks themselves actually go through two phases, ready and release. The readying phase is when you pull your weapon back ready to swing it into the enemy's face and you can hold it here as long as you'd like and then release is of course when you swing that weapon towards the enemy to land a blow. And there's some kind of ready and release for every weapon in every situation, whether you're an archer or you're on a horse. And tying into this, you can also perform a quick attack by readying and immediately releasing. Or you can perform a heavy attack by holding that readying phase for a short duration and then releasing for a little bit more damage. So of course the trade-off is that a quick attack will be performed quicker but will do less damage. While the heavy attack will do more damage but takes longer and is far more telegraphed so easier to block. Learning when and where to use each kind of strike is going to play a big part of mastering combat. And then we have chain attacks as well to get the hang of. This is simply linking two or more attacks together for a relentless assault. It's not as simple as just spamming attacks though, you will need some timing to make the most of it. If you get your button presses down at the right timing, you can actually get accelerated speed on your follow up chain attacks. There's also going to be attacker's stun to think about, which is how long you have to wait before you can attack again, depending on whether you hit flesh, armor or a shield. More on that in a bit though. So that covers most of the basic elements of attacking. Like I said, it's a simple system that you can get by on just mashing buttons, but if you really want to be decent at it and efficient, you'll have to start putting all this stuff together with damage zones, chain attacks, quick and heavy attacks, etc. Now let's take a look at our defensive counterpart, with some basic blocking. So as many of you will know, blocking is simply a case of matching the direction of an incoming attack. So if someone swings towards your left side, you block to your left side. If someone swings overhead, you block upwards. Again, it's a very simple system, but you do need to be pretty quick. So fights are just two people playing a little directional mini game until one of them catches the other one out and lands a hit. And then a few more hits until they're dead. However, if you're the defender, you can make life a lot easier for yourself by using a shield, as it's far more forgiving if you make a directional mistake. In fact, you don't even really need to think about directions too much. If you block in pretty much any direction, there's a high chance you'll still block the weapon from making contact with you. There's still blocking to the left, right, up and down with shields, but like I say, it's far more forgiving. It would have to be a pretty big mistake like blocking to the left when the opponent's swinging to the right. Then maybe you'll get hit. So blocking is very simple, at least when you're using a shield. It is significantly harder when not using a shield and you will have to pay a lot of attention to what your enemy is doing. Again, it's a simple system, easy to pick up, but difficult to master. But wait, there is obviously more. There are in fact two kinds of block, active and passive. An active block is performed right at the last second as a weapon is about to make contact with you and will result in the attacker having to wait longer before he can attack again that is longer attacker stun. And as for a passive block, that's when somebody blocks continuously waiting for a strike to come in, whether that's just hiding behind a shield or putting up a directional block a bit early. And because this is the easier of the two blocks, you don't get as much of a reward as a defender so the attacker doesn't get as much stun. So watch closely and you'll notice that the actively blocked attacker has to wait longer before he can attack again. So you see both attacks land at the same time, but the passively blocked attacker is able to attack again a lot sooner because he doesn't have that longer stun duration to wait for. 
Now, it may not look like much, it's only a small bit of time difference, but that bit of time could be enough to allow you to sneak a counter attack in. This is of course great against people who are just spamming attacks at you, as you'll be able to predict their attacks, get an active block in, give them a longer stun, and sneak in a cheeky counter attack while they're just spamming away, not thinking about defense. So it's gonna be more risky going for those active blocks because you might mess it up and they'll hit you, but if you can pull it off, it'll give you a slight edge. If you wanna play it safe though, you can go for those passive blocks, but you'll have to find another way to gain an advantage. And another pro to bringing a shield to block with is that you can block incoming projectiles. Arrows, javelins, throwing axes, all become wasted in the face of an almighty shield. Although beware, unless all of your body is entirely covered in shield, you will still be susceptible to being shot in exposed areas or from angles from which you can't protect. However, you can crouch with a shield, so you can make yourself a bit of a smaller target behind the shield, reducing the chance that some kind of missile will harm your puny human flesh. And I should give a bit of a mention to armor, even though it's one of those self-explanatory, pretty obvious things. You're going to have lighter armors, more medium middle armors, and then your heavy armors, each providing more protection the heavier you get. With the downside that you're weighed down more, you're heavier, so you move slower and run slower. If you're a guy like this fella, who's only got an axe, he's got light armor on, no shield, no spears, nothing extra to carry. Compare him to this fella, who's got big heavy armor, a massive shield, a spear, and a sword he moves considerably slower. So it's gonna depend on your preferred playstyle, whether you like to be a bit tanky, but a fair bit slower, or if you wanna be a bit more quick and nifty on your feet at the expense of your defenses with less armor or equipment such as a shield. But it goes without saying that both armor and shields are gonna help keep you alive out on the battlefield, especially with all the arrows flying around out there. So definitely some risk and reward decisions to make for your army. So with that, we conclude the basics of attacking and defense in Bannerlord combat. Now let's move on to a few more of the slightly more advanced techniques. Beginning with good old feints. This is when you show the enemy that you're going to attack in a certain direction, and then when he goes to block that way, you secretly change to a different direction, catching him out and landing a hit. Here's a few quick examples. I'm going to show this guy that I'm attacking high, but that's just a feint for my actual strike, which is going to come in from the right, meaning we've tricked him into blocking in the wrong direction. So of course he's blocked high when I've attacked right, I am gonna land the hit and down he goes. This guy, I'm gonna telegraph an attack from the right, he blocks to the right, I switch to the left and off comes his face. So it's just a means to try and catch out your opponent by making them block in the wrong direction. Especially effective against those without shields because a shield is, as I said, much more forgiving. So even if you block in the wrong direction and get tricked by a feint, there's still a good chance that you'll block the attack. You do have to be careful though, because if you go to faint when your opponent goes to actually attack, they'll hit you before you get a chance to attack. So you may need to change to a block. Now let's talk about chambers. Don't know what that is? Allow me to explain. This is when your enemy attacks you and you attack him back at the perfect moment to block his strike with your weapon, allowing you to then continue on with your attack, which in most cases will result in the enemy getting hit because he'll be too slow to block. Here it is again, uninterrupted, he attacks, I attack at the perfect moment to block his attack, allowing me to put in a cheeky counter attack. Now, while this is a very powerful technique, it is incredibly difficult. Here's me trying to figure out the timing of it. In about 30 tries, I probably pulled it off three or four times. It's very tough, even in this controlled situation. You need to attack at the perfect moment in the right direction as well. And even in a controlled situation like this, it's pretty damn tough. So that begs the question, is it worthwhile trying to go for chambers in the heat of combat? I would say hell freaking no. With all the men running around all over the place, horses charging around, arrows flying overhead, it's simply going to be too much of a distraction to try and focus and land a chamber. If you practice enough, maybe you could pull it off, but even then, is it worth the risk when you can die in one or two hits? Well, that's up to you. Maybe in duels, they'll be a bit more useful as you have a bit more chance to pull them off. So for now, personally, I wouldn't worry about chambers. I've heard they are going to rework the chamber system though, maybe to make them easier to execute. We'll see how they go, but at the moment, probably not worth it. Now to various kinds of interrupts and stuns. Firstly, you can interrupt yourself. If you're swinging your weapon or about to swing your weapon, you can quickly change it to a block to save yourself if you see an incoming attack, or you can simply use it to feint. You can interrupt your own attack at any point during the readying phase, but in the release phase of your attack, there's only a small window where you'll be able to interrupt it. After that, you've committed to the strike. Now for a more offensive interrupt, a good old fashioned Leonidas style kick. 
This could be used to interrupt an enemy attack or to break their block, resulting in a small immobilizing stun for the defender. This is generally seen as a more offensive interrupt as it stuns the attacker and potentially allows you to get a hit in, albeit at a little bit more risk that you might miss with the kick or that you'll get hit while trying to do it. The other interrupt choice you have is a bash. This can be performed with one or two handed weapons or if you have one equipped, a shield. A bash is seen as more of a defensive technique rather than offensive as it doesn't stun the opponent for very long but it will push them back further giving you a little bit of breathing room, especially against those over-aggressive opponents. So if you want to level up your combat prowess above the basic level, you want to start learning where and when to put kicks and bashes into play. They can be very useful for throwing people off and for punishing those over-aggressive spammers. I've also noticed that you seem to get an accelerated chain attack if you land a successful kick and attack straight away, like here, or here, or here. So definitely a worthwhile way of punishing those who would hide behind their shield, allowing you to potentially sneak a hit in. Worthwhile remembering when facing those shield users. So those are the main kinds of stuns and interrupts. You can be knocked over by horses as well, which will put you on the ground for a short duration. And then there's the obvious side of taking any damage. If you get shot by an arrow or hit with a weapon, you will be flinched and stunned briefly. And there's one more thing I should mention, even though I can't tell you a great deal about it, and that is crush throughs. As you can see in the bottom left, it says crushed through when I did that attack. The simplest explanation I can give you of this is when attack power is greater than defense power. So an attack can be so strong and powerful that someone can throw up a block, but the block is too weak to stop all that power and thus it gets crushed through and the defender still takes damage. This crushed through system though is currently being reworked, so we'll have to see how it ends up. And the last element of melee combat is going to be all about your movement, specifically learning to control the distance and timing during a fight. There's a lot more to using a weapon than simply swinging it around all over the place. You've got to get to know the distance of the weapons that you're using. How far do they reach? How close do you need to be to your target? How far away from them do you need to be to avoid their weapon? Is their weapon lengthier than yours? How are you going to create an advantage in that situation? So it's learning to gauge the distance and then tying in your timing with that. Like when to attack, when to defend, when to try a cheeky little trick. That's another video for another day because there's a lot to it. But just know that if you try to just spam attacks and charge at people, you are probably gonna die. If you have previous experience in Warband or something like Chivalry or Mordhau, then you'll probably have a good idea of how this is gonna work. But oh wait, there's a cheeky movement mechanic that is easily overlooked. Stances. Notice here that my left foot is forward and thus my left shoulder is forward. This is going to affect the distance that my left and right swing has to travel. With my left foot forward, my left swing doesn't have as far to travel as my right swing. So that is going to factor into timing. If I put my right foot forward, it's the opposite way around. Now my right swing is shorter and my left swing has further to go. So depending on which direction you move in at the time of your swing, that's going to affect which stance you're in, left or right foot forward orthodox or southpaw if you know you're fighting. Okay, for an example, on the left we've got our left foot forward and on the right our right foot forward and we perform a right swing. Now that was certainly too fast to notice so let's slow it down. Both of my dudes gonna swing from the right side each with a different foot forward. They're readied and are gonna release at the same time and you should notice if we stop about here Having the right foot forward on a right swing has made the sword reach the middle of the camera sooner than the left side. So there is a difference in the distance that the weapon has to travel depending on which stance you have, left or right foot forward. Now the difference is only very, very small, but it's the type of thing that if you can learn to master could be a good little advantage in beating people to the punch, making your swing land sooner than theirs. So stances are a thing and they're there if you want to try and master them and manipulate them into some sort of an advantage. But again, is this going to be the type of thing that you'll be able to think about in the heat of a crazy battle with loads of dudes flying around all over the place? Maybe not. Maybe in those one-on-one -on -one duel situations, which may occasionally happen in bigger battles or in specific arena type duel modes, it could have a place. Learning to combine that stance with moving in the right direction from the right swing direction, the right timing, landing in a good damage zone, getting a good impact point on the weapon, you could learn to maximize your damage output. Easier said than done, but the mechanics are there for it to potentially be a thing. 
So that overall is the most of it in terms of the systems of combat for melee infantry in Bannerlord. Like I said, I think it's a fairly simple system that's quite easy to pick up, but there are some finer details which you'll need to master if you really want to get good at Bannerlord combat. And of course, it'll already feel very familiar to all the Warband veterans, but there are some new elements to get used to. But melee combat is only half the story. Ranged and cavalry combat is a big part of things too, obviously. The ranged system works like any other game, as you might expect. You need to aim up if you want to get more distance. You need to lead the target if they're moving. So this all helps it to stay pretty familiar and thus fairly easy to pick up. One difference though is that speed is now a big factor in how much damage your projectile will do. As you may have seen in my How Damage Works video, Bannerlord's combat is physics based. So if somebody runs towards a javelin, it'll do more damage than if they're running away from it. Just something to think about when you are choosing your targets perhaps. Most of your ranged weapon skills though will obviously come down to how good you can aim. When it comes to the cavalry, it's going to be more of what you know and love. You're going to be running around, stabbing stuff with lengthy spears, or maybe you'd rather get up close and personal and cut somebody's face off with your sword. Again, the physics system is going to make speed a big factor in determining your damage. And then you have couching of lances, which is incredibly powerful and will kill pretty much anybody in one hit, unless maybe they can get a shield blocker. Only certain types of weapons can do this though, so it's not going to be for every cavalry type or polar. And that, I think, just about rounds it all up. That is most of the elements coming into play in Bannerlord combat, with perhaps the final element being your own situational awareness. Knowing what's going on around you at all times, having the good sense to see a bad situation and avoiding it, rather than charging in blindly like a blithering idiot. Or seeing an advantageous situation and seizing it. This goes for your individual one-on-one -on -one combat with someone and your army-wide combat. Learn to read a situation and realize when it's a bad move or a good move. I can't tell you how many dummies I see in captain mode in the beta charging their one single unit into about four of the enemies. So there you go, how combat works in Bannerlord. We've got just over a month to wait before we can all dive into early access. You'll all be able to get into this multiplayer stuff and of course the single player side of things which is not in the beta so that's going to be new to everybody. But do remember all the information you have gained in this video and all the footage you see in this video is from the Bannerlord beta. As I say, things are subject to change. Not everything is finished yet. Some things are being reworked. So do bear that in mind before you come moaning in the comments about something you don't like. So whether you decide to become the finest swordsman in the land, a master archer, or a swift and deadly horseman, hopefully this guide gives you a better idea of what the hell is going on all around the battlefield all of the time. If you still want more information though, you can check out my How Damage Works video, which should be on the screen any second now. And with that, I hope you've enjoyed this. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in the future. Not long till early access, lads. Not long.